Hello, my name is Veronica from Punkfish Academy and Punkfish Diving. Today we will continue with oxygen toxicity and we will talk about the most important, the one that really scares divers, with this, which is the CNS toxicity, the toxicity that affects the central nervous system and can lead to cramps underwater. So we will explain a little bit what it is actually. We will make clear why the limits are chosen, how they are chosen, and how they really work to prevent this toxicity. And we will explain a little bit about why it is so difficult to put any limits, um, because it's not really predictable when uh, toxicity will happen and when not. So what's this central nervous system toxicity? It's called as well the Paul Bird effect because he was the guy who first observed these uh, symptoms. And it is a very dangerous condition that can occur when you breathe oxygen with a very high partial pressure. A very high partial pressure means a lot higher than our limit. It will not happen at 1.4 bar and it will not happen at 1.6 bar of partial pressure of oxygen. Um, the limits are set very strictly because a CNS toxicity, an oxygen toxicity that hits the central nervous system is so incredibly dangerous that it's nearly impossible to survive this underwater because it can lead to cramps and when you cramp somewhere underwater like you may not survive the seizures the toxicity itself will not kill you if oxygen toxicity happens in a dry hyperbaric chamber it's not a big issue. It's something you can treat and you can get rid of this. But the problem are the seizures. The mechanism of how this toxicity happens are not 100% clear, but very likely it has to do with reactive oxygen species, ROS, which are like single oxygen parts that want to react with something else in the body. As these have to build up, it is quite logical that this kind of toxicity does not happen from two or three breaths. It always takes a little bit of time until the onset of the first symptoms is visible. It is not clear when exactly symptoms will appear, but the risk gets higher with a higher PO2 and it gets higher with a longer exposure. So when we talk about the limits of exposure, we always have limits in PO2 and we have limits in how long can we be exposed to this specific PO2. We recognize that an oxygen toxicity is starting. The problem is that when it comes to the convulsions, like the end point of oxygen toxicity, it is usually too late. We need to understand that there are some signs before it gets really difficult, which are like you feel that there's something strange in your vision. You don't really see what's going on. You get kind of a tunnel vision. You have changes in your perception as well in your hearing. You might be a little bit nauseous and you might have a strange taste in your mouth. Like strange things that happen to you when you are with a high percentage of oxygen or when you did change the gas are something that should make you very careful because if you feel the symptoms, you may be able to still react 
to it. So do we have to be worried about oxygen toxicity when we're diving with nitrox? Honestly, not really, because as long as we stay inside the generally recognized limits of 1.4 bar PO2, and if we use it as a decompression gas, we can go up to 1.6 bar PO2. If you, we use it for a very long time on a rebreather, we might choose 1.3 or even less. But as long as we stay inside these limits, we can breathe this pressure of oxygen for a longer time than our dive normally lasts. And these limits are set in a way that we can be really, really sure that no toxicity will happen in these limits. The known cases of oxygen toxicity underwater are cases where these limits were exceeded by far and for long. To plan your dives according to the nitro to plan your dives according to the oxygen exposure limits, you will find this CNS clock, this CNS exposure table in the SSI material. You find this in your app and you can just use this to check the time you can be exposed to a specific PO2. Your computer will do this automatically, so very likely you don't have to worry about this, but you just have to observe the percentage of CNS kind of saturation that your computer gives you. And as long as you respect this and don't get over 100 or let's say stay a little bit away from the limits, don't get over 80, you will be fine. What's important to know is that this exposure table is actually not based on science or there is no empiric studies behind this that prove that a certain exposure is well tolerated or that there is a given limit. The problem is that the risk of getting an oxygen toxicity hit gets higher with a higher PO2 and with a longer exposure. And th these limits are limits where we really do not expect any problems for anyone. So you are at the safe side, but no, these limits are not scientifically backed up because the real reactions on exposures on higher oxygen pressures are rather chaotic and you cannot really put them into this kind of limits. But anyway, even if the science behind this clock is not very clear, as long as we respect these limits, we can be sure that oxygen toxicity hits are more than unlikely. They just will not happen. And the good thing is that long-term oxygen exposure is just calculated into these limits as well. So actually, as long as we follow these limits, we don't have to worry about our oxygen exposure. The general problem in oxygen toxicity is that it's unpredictable in which moment the toxicity will hit a specific person. What you can see here is the onset of symptoms in one person in different exposures. And you can see that this is absolutely chaotic. He can feel the first symptoms after five minutes. And in another day, another exposure, he can tolerate the same PO2 for over two hours before he actually starts to feel something. And these were experiments with partial pressures of oxygen of more than three bar. So really far away from what we normally do. Now, these experiments were made in a dry chamber. This is where you can risk an oxygen toxicity because it will not kill you. 
when we are underwater, it's very likely that the symptoms appear a lot faster because there is a lot of exertion when we are diving. There is a higher work of breath and we have the diving reflex. That means the level of carbon dioxide rises and this leads to our vessels in the brain dilating and we get more oxygen into our brain and that means that very likely the onset of symptoms appears a lot faster than in a dry chamber. The important thing here is that it is not predictable in which moment symptoms will happen, but in some moment they will appear. And the other thing is that it's not a matter of seconds or something like this. It takes some minutes until symptoms can start to show. So this is why when you're afraid of oxygen toxicity, that's good, but you don't have to panic about this because as long as we are in the limits of 1.6 or even 1.4 bar PO2, or we just exceed this for a short moment, there is not really a risk that something will happen to us. The risk is there when we accidentally breathe the wrong gas, like the real risk is in confusing gases. This can happen in technical diving when you take different decompression gases and you might have a pure oxygen with you and start to breathe this at 20 meters. This can cause real problems. It can happen that you grab a tank that was not yours and you take a tank with a lot higher oxygen percentage than what you think you are breathing. This could happen. So the easiest way to prevent oxygen toxicity is to analyze and label your tanks, breathe what you analyzed yourself, stick to the limits, but without panic. If you exceed your 1.4 bar PO2 for a minute because you want to help someone or there's something you want to see or you are just unaware for a moment, don't panic, it will be fine. Just come up a little bit shallower again, relax and enjoy the rest of your dive.